there's a lot of different people working on harnessing games and gameplay to assess learning. And so one of our goals for this event was to bring those people together as well as other people that are beyond the Working Examples community. And so what we're, what I thought we would do today is uh, have Eric Harpstead introduce himself and tell us a little bit about the work that he does. This is super informal, so uh, everybody will have a chance to talk about their work and ask questions to the group. And hopefully the last part we can uh, talk about some of the challenges you might be facing uh, and do some problem solving together. If you want to use the chat section just to introduce yourself for now, maybe say where you work and what you do. I think most of you are researchers. Maybe there's a couple of teachers in there. Um, that would be great. And also include your questions in the chat as well. And for those of you who didn't hear, Courtney Francis is here. She's under the working examples name, uh, helping me do troubleshooting if necessary. Uh, so Eric, you want to get things started? Uh, sure. Uh, so, hi everybody, can you all hear me? I think, I think we're good. Um, so my name is Eric Harpstead. I'm a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon University in human computer interaction. And uh, I generally study um, educational games and sort of the process around designing and developing them. And so some of the work that I've done in the past um, and sort of carries into what I work on now is um, ways of taking educational games and, and trying to come up with um, trying to measure concepts that are, might be interesting to educators um, from the way that players play them or from what players do in the game, things like that. And uh, what generally interests me is um, we're generally pretty good at knowing what it is we we care about like concept wise and we're generally pretty good in terms of um, sort of the history of statistics and student modeling and stuff of um, tracking performance over time but what we're really bad at is defining what in a game corresponds to the concepts that we find interesting um, and so trying to help people understand how what they were trying to measure correlates to what it is they actually are doing and helping designers when they're building an educational game or teachers working with an educational game uh, get a sense of am I really accomplishing the goals I set out to do is kind of the space that I've become really interested in recently um, and then how is sort of that manifests in software so a lot of what I've looked at is um, a system what I call replay analysis and so games are essentially full of uh, context and um, sort of relevant signal that might be useful in assessment. And rather than sort of assuming or, or choosing where to point your microphone in terms of measurement, um, let's just point it everywhere and then look at the replay and try to reconstruct concept sort of post hoc. That's a lot of what I've been doing recently. Um, but yeah, that's sort of a brief introduction. Um, I suppose I can sound off as well. Um, yeah, so since there's only a handful of us here, does everybody just want to verbally introduce themselves and kind of give a background? Uh, I don't know, if Randall, would you be interested in going? Uh, or anybody? I'm happy to start. I'll give the I'm, Audible. Um, go ahead, Bert. Okay. So I'm actually a um, I'm a, a designer and, and uh, with a focus on on learning games over and games used in learning in a lot of different contexts over the last ten years. And before that, um, I founded a company that was early on in music and rock and roll computer games and did a lot of work designing those games in Japan where they were at that time more successful. Anyway, um, so I, I'm, I'm the lead design at Muzzy Lane and we're a company that really has has been working in games and learning across a pretty wide swath of different topics ranging from sort of history, complex history strategy, strategy games to language learning to sort of more process oriented simulations and, and so we're we're you know 
typically engaged in in creating something that uses sort of games in a way to create strong contextual learning um, opportunities and uh, and sort of practice and mastery development opportunities. And then as part of that are sort of given the challenge to understand you know what levels of you know understand mastery that's that uh, players might be gaining and sort of to do that without sort of um, well to do that while using good game design principles to be designing you know the mechanics so that you know sort of the learning and, and experience is really happening but also how to track that and what to track and how you know I, I won't go too far but but um, you know, interesting questions for us is often things, you know, good designs will involve strategic decision making on the part of players, you know, um, where they're looking at multiple factors and sort of weighing them and making a decision about what they're going to do. And so we're often interested in looking at ways in which we can understand from the decisions they make and from different sort of data in different parts of say a simulation system in a game where a student is under or a student or player is understanding things well or where they're having trouble um, so it's a little bit like what Eric was describing we, we get we have the advantage of being able to design the systems to try to give us the data we're looking for but it's still very challenging anyway I'll stop there Thanks. Carrie, do you want to go next? Sorry, I'm trying to take notes. Um, I'm Carrie Staples, and I teach at the in the design program at the University of Tennessee. And I'm a graphic designer, and I've gotten into game design fairly recently as a way to try and create experiences to facilitate open-ended learning. Um, I'm teaching freshmen now, and I'm really frustrated with the answer question, right answer dynamic. Um, so uh, I'm working, I work collaboratively with colleagues in a variety of different disciplines. I'm working with colleagues in education, um, doing some game mechanics with them. And I'm also working with uh, ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, and also possibly a botany project. So, um, and Chinese, foreign language. So, uh, the idea behind the design is the same and trying to create effective um, environments. And the piece that I guess I get hung up on, especially with granting, is the assessment piece. Because um, I have a pretty good sense of what good design is, but I don't have the ability to be able to document whether the metrics are being created. So I'll stop there. Okay. Uh, Neil, go. Uh, I'm a PhD student. Um, I'm from Belgium. I don't know, are you all from the United States or are there any other so. foreign? Okay, cool. Um, so I'm a PhD student, a uh, PhD student in the arts, and I work. Uh, my work involves rehabilitation games. So for people who have suffered a stroke, um, and what we try to do is to let them relearn their tasks, uh, physical tasks like drinking from a glass, like picking up a glass, um, or driving a car and um, to do this in a fun way. Uh, and my work focuses on creating game concepts around, that, uh, around those tasks. Um, well, I presented, or I presented a talk at the GLS Working Examples. Um, you can find it on the Working Examples page two. And it's all about like create instead of like integrating um, learner tasks 
within a game. I want to create games which flow out of the uh, learner tasks. So I actually want to adjust the game concept or build it entirely on uh, the create on using the, the the learner demands as creative um, creative ideas. I, I don't know if that's clear for everyone. Okay, yeah, that's it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have more time for questions too. So I guess if people have questions, keep them in mind. Yeah, uh, and can bring it bring it up later. Uh, I don't know, Randall. Do you have your audio working? If you want to do a quick intro, uh, you can. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah. My uh, it was all choppy, so I had to shut off my video. Now I can hear everybody. Everybody. Else. Otherwise, it was like I could hear every other word. So. Um, I'll introduce myself, uh, Randall Fujimoto. I'm in Southern California, uh, near uh, in the LA area. I, uh, the director of a nonprofit uh, 501c3 organization called Game Train Learning, and our goal uh, is to, or our mission is to simply promote game-based learning in all of education. And uh, major programs are to, to, number one, to help teachers get up to speed in using game-based learning in classrooms. Uh, number two is to do curriculum design with teachers to get them to integrate gaming into their uh, into their curriculum and, and pedagogy. So uh, working with a lot of different school systems and uh, schools and teachers uh, across the country now. So it's, uh, it's a big need that, that uh, this teacher education area in game-based learning. So the uh, assessment piece, they're always asking, they're always being assessed and there's always, there's a, they're always asking for different ways to uh, collect data on their students uh, in order to provide that to the to parents and to the schools. So uh, the, the data collection in, in a lot of these newer games, like Glass Lab games, etc., cetera, um, seems like it's a, a big area that uh, people like us can focus on and, and take advantage of and, and uh, make use of in the best ways throughout the school system. You guys get all that? Yep, great, thanks. Yeah. Uh, it looks like we have a couple other people going in and out, uh, so maybe there'll be somebody else uh, to introduce themselves later. Uh, so I guess at this point, does anybody have any questions they'd ask to, like to ask the group? I have some questions, but uh, I'd much rather have this be driven by you guys if you have something in mind. So. Yours might, mine might be as similar to yours. I, I'd be, we're all sort of doing really different things. Um, but I'm, would be interested for those that are, um, well, so sort of describing particularly assessment challenges or assessment goals that you might see or, or think are important in a, in a game-based context and, and, uh, ways that you've approached those or thought about approaching them would be, I don't know if that, that might not be the best starting question, <laughs> but <laughs> that would be a way to sort of hear more about people's experience and what they've seen and has worked and so forth. Yeah, I think that's a great place to start. Uh, anybody have anything they'd, they'd like to start off? Let me... Uh, so, so like assessment goals or assessment strategies, or is that kind of the same thing? Or just pick one and go for it. Um, <laughs> or do you do you have, do you have a preference in one or the other? I'd say you kind or of maybe you, you goal have... goal first, goal first, and then sort and of how, do you how you might have approached it. it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've found. I'm actually covering my mic, sorry, uh, is, uh, is this notion of what I've been calling alignment. So essentially, um, when, you, when you, you create a game or you create some experience, you create some instruction, um, and it has some sort of implicit goal structure to it. Like you have, you know, you, it's about something. And, um, and you come up with some way of getting to it, uh, usually some kind of logging in the games that I work with, or if it's 
like more of a physical kind of interaction game, you have some sort of way of watching students play it and kind of ticking off whether or not they're they're getting the the um, the intended message. But what's interesting to me is sort of you created something and you go off with it, and does it actually does your assessment actually align to what it is you thought you made? Uh, and then what is the difference there, and is that important? And so you can run into these sort of interesting issues of um, you built a game and it was about something and then you found out it actually doesn't accomplish that goal very well, do you change the game or you just change what it's about? Um, and so we've run into some interesting issues like that um, in our work. <clears throat> and in, depending on the space, like if you're targeting something like Common Core, it's a little harder to say, well, now it's about something different, but um, but that's kind of going to depend upon your uh, sort of affordances of your context. So I would say alignment to me is one of the, the primary goals. It would seem like that could be, you know, that that aspect of you discovered that what you thought it was going to do is not what it's doing is sort of in some ways it seems like it's unavoidable. There's always some of that, but if you if you then say oh, that's interesting, so now we've discovered that this set of kind of mechanics does this, then you might be able to bring that back into play in some other context. Um, we've definitely sort of found that something that you had to take it out in one place, you sort of put it on the shelf and say, later that might be useful. So I'm happy to go, I'll, I'll just pick one quick goal and, and um, so, um, so I'll pick actually a language learning game project, which is um, more, in a sense, it's it's performance based. But the the goal was to assess language skills in conversation without sort of turning conversations into, um, you know into a into a quiz or into some you know to still keep the conversational flow and focus and um, the the approach that we've ended up taking and are sort of still testing is one where we're um, sort of essentially letting the conversation continue and not kind of trying to give uh, constant feedback on whether a performance at that moment is is correct or good, but to be sort of tracking that and sort of giving sort of subtler feedback while letting the the gameplay um, continue and and paying attention to things like s sort of streaks, like how many times in a row you might have had trouble with something or how many times in a row you did something that seemed like you did it skillfully, and just sort of collecting this and trying to sort of it's it's in a sense thinking about kind of assessing skill as an as a general approach to it. Like you you know, it could be that you're you could be thinking as if you're playing a guitar, but actually you're you're trying to speak and use grammar and vocabulary. So anyway. Great. Anybody else have anything they want to add about their own experience? Okay. Uh, so one of the I I, questions. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. I'm sorry. I guess I had a question. Um, it, that's an interesting idea about how quickly you provide feedback. Um, do you have a sense of of whether the feedback needs to be immediate or how long that gap can be before you before somebody feels lost? I mean, one thing that, that that games do well is they they you know well you might have built a game to be able to give feedback immediately and from a from a pedagogical standpoint it might be really good to be giving that feedback immediately but if you're trying to create sort of a flowing experience then it's easy for that sort of feedback to sort of fundamentally change what's going on. You're sort of saying, am I getting it right? Am I getting it right? As opposed to 
experiencing it. So I think it really depends on the context. I think in general, people would probably say, give it to me sooner, but um, you, know, you might even abstract the feedback so that there's something going on that's letting you know that something's happening, but you're trying not to have it take over the experience. Yeah, and, and I'd like to sort of add on to that too, is um, in generally research tends to find that immediate feedback is usually better. Uh, I think there was actually a, a review, like a, like a lit review at GLS two years ago that showed that. Uh, I might be conflating that with another time I heard the same guy talk about similar work, but um, and I can I can try to find that. But um, they've also been there's also been some interesting work into sort of this idea that if you're always giving immediate feedback, you're always sort of course correcting a student back onto some optimal path. They never really get to wrestle with the chance of being off the optimal path. And so there's there's some extent like you want them to be generally using their time well. Okay, um, but uh, but there's also sort of it is a skill to get back into being correct as well. So there's sort of a challenge, and it, it is going to be very contextual and, and topic driven, I think, um, as to which one you would prefer. Uh, Andre, are you there? Oh, we just lost him. I think he's having technical problems. Uh, anybody else, anything they want to add to that? Oh, hey, Rex. Hey. I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe I, uh, I have a question. Can you hear us, like, Rex? A, like a general question for everyone? Yeah, please go. Um, yes. Like we were talking about assessing um, game mechanics or general game concepts. And I was wondering how you guys, um, how, how much time or what, what sort of effort you put into making the game mechanic or the other game concept, uh, whatever you like, um, to assess. Because um, in my research, I have two types of goals. Like one is I want to integrate physical learning in my game, but I also have um, players with disabilities, like visual disabilities, or um, like they can, like their dexterity is reduced. So I have to pay attention which mechanics um, I, I integrate, and I will give you like a very concrete example. Um, for instance, like a lot of games that I see. Uh, on rehabilitation, use complex interfaces. And this is really difficult for um, people who have suffered from a stroke to use, both in terms of visual complexity, as well as like moving the mouse pointer towards like a certain interface button. And I see all these games using interfaces. And then I ask the question like, why should we use an interface in a game. Um, there are plenty of examples of games which are abstract, which are minimalistic, but which are fun to play and do not have uh, like an interface. So what I'm, why, what I'm getting at is like in my research I noticed that like the way you build your game concept influences what you are testing. So how much time do you spend creating the game concept, which heavily influences what your test results will be? Well, respond to that, or Rex, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Rex. Uh, is Yakao, but that's OK. <laughs> I'm with Game Desk here in Los Angeles. I just had some technical difficulties, and here I am. Great, glad you're here. Uh, so I asked everybody if they had specific questions they wanted to ask the group, so feel free to jump in, anybody at any point, to ask questions. Uh, does anybody have one, or should I ask one of mine? I realize I'm muted. I was going to just give Niels a quick answer to his question, which is just sort of one, one point.
point answer, which is that um, it's not so much a question of how much time, but I think you've hit a, a really key point, which is that that if you are um, designing the instrument, the game that you're going to going to test, then that's it's crucial, and and that you might even you, you might even adopt sort of the kind of iterative design processes that normally get used in game design, where you'd say try you know build some core mechanics and and do an initial test, but un, but expect that you're going to do you know several iterations of that before you get to something where you really feel like you're hitting what you want to test. And and by the way, and you should you should uh, you should uh, go and start building some of those interface-free ga uh, games <laughs> right away. Go to it; the world needs it. <laughs> I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Uh, maybe to respond on that, um, like you you talk about like um, iterative process and iterative design process, and to, to like extend my question, like. Uh, Donald Norman, he wrote a pretty interesting paper. I will look it up and, and put it in the chat box. And he said, like, um, you have different kinds of progress, like technological progress or progress of game design, doesn't matter what. And you can work in iterative design, in an iterative design way, but you can also, like, um, I don't know how, how you put it exactly, but iteration means that you build on a concept and you refine it further and further and further. But he said, like, if you want to innovate or if you want to create new concepts, um, you need to you need to change the meaning or you need to change the meaning of, of what you're using. So essentially, you need to you need to explore new concepts. And what I've noticed in my research is that like a lot of people they select um, a certain game concept and refine it but what do you guys think is more useful like like selecting a game concept and refining it or before you select a game concept look like you're gonna look real wide to other game concepts and you you're gonna like like not how do I put it like you can say I'm gonna build a shooter game and then refine that, but maybe your learning goals are better suited for like a strategy game. Um, so, so how do you guys respond to that? I think there's certainly always an important that needs to be made between learning goals and the type of game that you choose to make the game that you're going to use to do that. So it's hard to assess somebody's mathematical competency in a game that involves very little numbers uh, in the same way that it's difficult to engage their creativity in the way that they're thinking if they're playing a game which is very straightforward and on rails and they have no way to actually think about it in a complex nature. I think that that's very important in the design process of thinking about what it is you're trying to assess and making sure that the mechanics of the game can actually connect to that. Yeah, I did. I'm not muted. I and I I would say for. Uh, the process that we've sort of arrived at over a lot of years is is very much to not expect that you're getting to kind of big big questions like what genre are you working with right away, but to to really start by breaking down, as Rex was saying, sort of starting with what your objectives are, and if your if your objectives involve you know and including how you're going what you want for assessment, and then let those uh, help you develop the mechanics and then let the mechanics suggest the genres, sort of building it as a more organic process.
I'm sorry, I just threw that into the chat, but that's that's the same way that we work is um, the form ends up hopefully being in service to whatever the goal of the experience is. And so I, I think of it as reverse engineering. Um, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? And then what are some interesting ways that we can create an experience or an environment to build that competency? Um, and it, it does sometimes butt heads. I mean, it's part of the reason why I'm here with the um, people who have very specific goals in terms of what they're trying to teach through the game. They're basically trying to take repetitive tasks and make them automated as opposed to really creating an, a thinking experience. Any other questions? So one of the questions that I had was from a slightly different perspective, thinking about teachers that are using games in their classroom and want to think about assessment. And I wonder from what, as all of you are experts in this area, so what advice would you have for teachers that are starting to think about this? Um, and, yeah. I think from the same category, you want to make sure that you're picking a game that does the thing that you're trying to assess. So uh, there's a lot of games right now, and you know, all of us who are part of this are thinking about how games can be used as assessments, uh, whether that's through an activity associated with the game, or whether that's through in-game data collection and telemetry and uh, analysis of that nature. So things that the jail research group and uh, Glass Lab are working on and uh, plenty of other people in this space. But for a teacher, the question is, what do you, what do you information uh, that gets kicked out to you? How does that inform the next steps that you take as a teacher to offer additional scaffolding to students who need it? Where is that? You know, where, what are their pain points and how can you address those specifically uh, based on the information that was collected in the game and their activity in that space? So does that mean you're going to give them another game that they're going to use that focuses on those skills? So like what Carrie was saying, if you have a simple uh, process, uh, maybe because you're failing at one particular task, now we give you this other game, which is a series of repeated tasks there, which is slightly lower in cognitive necessity, which allows you to scaffold back up into the original one. Uh, but I think to think of the games as a suite of tools, more so than working in isolation, could be a really helpful way for teachers to approach this in a meaningful way for their classrooms. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, yeah. Uh, so oh, go for it. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was just going to tag on to that, which is basically kind of saying, bringing up a similar, similar response. But um, a thing that uh, we say around here a bit, which I borrow kind of from uh, Jesse Shell, who's a professor of game design at Carnegie Mellon, is that when you're trying to do an educational game, or, and, and so to some extent, I kind of read out of this question that it's it's how does a student, how does a teacher select the game they're trying to use, not just. I mean, I think that's part of it. If you if you're thinking about what you're trying to measure, you should also kind of be thinking about, is the game I'm using good for that? Um, but uh, like the, the sort of perspective is, well, if you know what you want your students to be able to try to do, even vaguely at like a strategy level or a, a task level or even a conceptual level, then the game better make them do that. Or the game better have, like, they better do what you're trying to measure in the game, or it's probably not very well suited for the kind of assessment you're looking at. Um, and so I think to some extent there is sort of this, this selection strategy element to talking about assessment in games as well. That's a good point. Um, so we've one one thing that I, I think for us we've had a lot of um, 
experience actually to having designed things that are then being used in classrooms and then talking with teachers who are using them or want to use them in different ways. And one of the things that's important for teachers to think about is um, that what they get from from a game does might not be and doesn't have to be and might not want to be uh, the same kind of assessment that they that they've been used to or, or that they've been getting out of other kind other modes of you know tests projects and and uh, that it's it's often not um, effective to say well I want I want to do a game but I want it to be gradable on A through F on these learning objectives which are the same learning objectives that I've you know that that I've been using in other ways but to recognize that um, that, that, a, that a, a well designed game experience is going to involve doing something as, as Eric was saying and that the things that you'll run into there are you know you're probably going to find things about you know putting things together and putting things in practice and making connections that that you don't that are harder to get at in other ways and so in a lot of ways assessing with with a game gives you opportunities that you didn't have you might not have had before and it's usually well it's it's effect it's effective to take advantage of those rather than saying i want this game to give me the you know to to fill to check all the same boxes that i would expect to be checking with it with tests and quizzes and other projects Uh, to kind of extend on on uh, what Burke said, um, like the assessment of rehabilitation, usually, like what the therapist want is to have a certain amount of exercises, like let's say ten exercises and then ten of a other kind. So they have a very rigid process of rehabilitation for each individual patient. Um, and that kind of counters the idea, I think, of free play, where you, uh, where you offer the player a room to experiment, um, to do what he or she likes to do. And, well, um, like you said, Bert, like you cannot offer the same kind of like if I understood what you said, you cannot offer the same kind of assessment that you get from like a more traditional or a, let's say non game like um, assessment. And that's what I what I also feel is true for the rehabilitation process that that you need to have different ways of assessing uh, learning games uh, because games provide that extra dimension and that extra dimension should be uh, should be included in the assessment so i'm curious how this uh, we're talking about a lot of different forms of assessment i think where we have assessment of you know in-game data we have what is the player actually doing in the game uh, Yeah, <laughs> I guess we lost Rex. Uh, oh, did you back. Back? Yeah, Eric, do you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I think I think I could bring up sort of the point that he was trying to bring up is is there sort of um, what do you kind of mean by assessment in this space? I think is unless he wants to pick it up again. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, I got kicked off. Yeah, go for it. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, so what I was getting at was that you have, you know, uh, telemetry data to collect information about actions that people type have in the game, and there's the assessment of 
did they complete particular objectives in the game? So instead of looking at all of the, the data points, just looking at tasks that are assigned in the game, uh, I mean, a simple one is like, how many hours did it take you to beat Halo? That's something you can use as an assessment. Um, and then also the external assessments that we're talking about of, you know, taking a test that's more traditional to assessment strategy outside of the game, or can that look like something else? Can you play a roller coaster tycoon in an assessment of your understanding of the engineering structures and knowledge behind that, make a roller coaster using marbles and Play-Doh or something off that nature? There's a variety of different assessments we can look at here, and I was curious uh, what experiences you have all had in the past. or reasons for using different assessments? Sure. Uh, I, I'll kind of chime in with stuff that I've, I've done in the past. Um, most of what I've been doing is, I think, so let, let me try to see if I can get a distinction in what you, you brought up. Is, is there's sort of like in-game, you, you sort of seem to have this notion of this, this real-time sort of strategy-based kind of assessment in-game, and then also kind of like, almost like checkpointy kind of thing. So like, did you beat the level? How much? Hour, how many hours did it take? Is more of like kind of almost like a summative game assessment, if I can, uh, versus more like a formative reading strategy as it's going on. Um, and then there's external. And so most of what I've done is actually been uh, sort of in-game summative assessments. So it's usually things that I run after a level has completed. But it's more looking at, at least in the games I've worked with, is is working with. Uh, something that a, a student has constructed in the game. So there's sort of strategy kind of implicit in that. And it's mainly that I've only looked at the end of the level just because it's less data that I have to deal with. Uh, I have all the real-time data that I could work with. I just haven't actually explored it yet. Um, and then we use external assessments more, in my opinion, because it's what science expects you to do. <laughs> uh, like. Uh, we, we could have the best internal assessment and it, no one's going to believe it until it correlates with an external one. Uh, and so to some extent, like, that's kind of, you have to do that. Um, and, and there is value to that, I think, that, like, getting convergent agreement among things. But to some extent, it does get kind of annoying that you always have to sort of respect that as well. Um. Yeah, someday. <laughs> or maybe not, but someday. Um. Yeah, so, so Rex, I guess my answer would be in a sense for us it's it's been a little it's been some of all, all of the above. Um, um, certainly the, the, the nice thing about the did you know the sort of did you complete objectives is if you can design for that where you know you can say there's a complex set of things that you have that that we know that you have to do you know in order to have solved this problem you have to have been able to understand the relationship between these variables and taken this kind of action then that lets you sort of get a very a simple assessment of a pretty complex um, you know set of actions and so if you're in the, if you're in the position where you're getting to design the game um, then, then that's you know that's really good, and and so that's a really I would say that's a really powerful way of of doing it because it basically lets you say, look, if I can design an experience in which we can look at it and say this outcome requires this, then then the assessment is simpler. Um, it's the 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 thing that's harder about that is that as soon as you do that, somebody will say. But how can I tell if somebody's having trouble <laughs> getting to this end? And so then you want to know, well, okay, in the midst of this system where, you know, somebody's not there, but they're partway there, how can you, how can you assess that? And then so, so there, we've done a lot of, we, we, we use the term KPIs, key performance indicator, which is actually, I think, something that comes from the world of r retail and, Process control and stuff like that, but um, but just sort of saying, can we find relationships where, like, if you've done this and that value, you know, like one an example I might use is a is a a game that we have for learning about marketing. So you know, if you have 
you know, if your product's a good fit with your target market and your um, your messaging is strong, and your you know, and, but your I won't go into too far, but you know, you you might find that if if three things are strong, then it might mean that you're having trouble with understanding distribution channels. So it's sort of basically looking at relationships, saying these three relationships are a key performance indicator that tells you that something you know, something's misunderstood there. So that's, it's telemetry, but it's not sort of action as much as it is relationships and between data. I really like what you said about the, the sort of checkpoint one where, you know, it's kind of like you have to designed that environment so well for you to know that a particular set of learning outcomes happened to achieve that goal. Like, that, that sounds really powerful. And if we could make, you know, angry birds, but by beating levels four, five, and six, we know you learned X, Y, and Z, that seems like that would be really cool. So seems really hard, but it also seems like it could be really cool. Yeah. I, I sort of say to my designers, it's like, it's game design with leg weights. <laughs> it is, because it's like there's so many constraints you end up with. And sometimes it's like you look at something and you go, I don't, you know, this may not be possible, you know, or this set of objectives may, may in fact work better through other media. But... We just have about five to eight minutes. Are there any other questions you guys have for the group? Or maybe you have a specific question or challenge that you're working on with, with your own work that you want to get feedback on? Well, actually, we didn't get to hear what Rex is up to. So that would be a, he missed his chance to. A... <laughs> yeah, tell us more, Rex. Uh, so I used to work with the, at the Games Learning Society Center in Madison, Wisconsin. I worked on the Playful Learning Project, oh, cool. and I uh, was doing a lot with teacher outreach, and I've now taken a job at Game Desk in Los Angeles to sort of more expansive level. So uh, working with schools and teachers about how to implement game-based learning and other similar style education activities within their classroom. Uh, and you know, the assessment aspect is one really important part of that. So teachers being able to say, I did activity with this game, and while this game has nothing to do with history, through the activities that we did with them, I can say that I hit X, Y, and Z common core history standard. So those are sorts of the things that I'm working on right now. Cool. Hey, Jolene, actually, I, I, could, uh, I could take a minute to... Uh to give it a, a plug for something that we're actually doing with just starting to do with working examples and actually everybody who is who is here would should all know about this but um, so over the last couple actually this is at, at the GLS conference um, I did a with uh, Jason Haas and Scott Osterweil and some other folks we did sessions that we called sort of ghost stories from learning game design where it was essentially it's kind of short storytelling about particular challenges and results and learnings that it so not not like a, a working example but a smaller form and we have um, you know we've collected the stories that were generated there and we're starting a group on the working examples site and uh, um, we'll be sort of looking to kind of develop that community and really it's we've kind of been doing some of that in this session actually because part of what we've ended up doing is sort of talking about ways we've attacked pro projects and what's come from it. So anyway, I'm sure I can I can track you all down, but it, I, I, we're hopeful that it's going to be um, an interesting way for all of us practitioners in our various ways that we're practicing to to share stories without, you know, in a in a short form way that can be helpful to all of us. Yeah, it should be so really shameless awesome. Plug over. <laughs> no problem. 
Yeah, you guys should all, if you're interested, you should share uh, your email or Twitter handles in the chat uh, so you can follow up with each other after this yeah. event. Anything else before we wrap up? Cool. Well, I really appreciate all of you guys being here and attending. This has been great. Um, if you have ideas for future webinars that you would like to be part of, please let us know. And we're going to put this recording, we'll probably put it up on our blog later this week or early next week. Uh, so I'll send it out to all of you at that point. Uh, but have a good night, and thanks again. All right, good to thanks. talk to everybody. Yep. Thanks. Nice to talk to everyone.